Welcome to the Fat Tony's Podcast, where we bridge the gap between everyday life and expert insight. Join us in conversation with real-world experts, gaining practical advice and strategies to navigate the complexities of the modern world. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Fat Tony's podcast. I'm your host, Seb Lees. Today's guest is Wall Street legend Jim O'Shaughnessy. Jim is an American investor and venture capitalist, currently serving as the CEO of O'Shaughnessy Ventures. He is also the founder of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, an asset management firm that was later acquired by Franklin Templeton. As if that wasn't enough, he's also written several books, including the bestsellers, What Works on Wall Street, and How to Retire Rich. What struck me most about talking with Jim was not just the breadth of his knowledge, but also his infectious optimism. I really, really enjoyed my conversation with Jim, and I hope you do too. Jim O'Shaughnessy, welcome to Fat Tony's. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Seb. Yeah, how are you? How's your week going? <laughs> you know, uh, with O'Shaughnessy Ventures, every week is an adventure. And because we have so many different verticals within the company, uh, my days are never boring. I can go from three documentary pitches to a hard science founder looking for funding through our adventures arm then we also have a book publisher coming online, so reviewing book proposals from folks. So always something different and always something quite interesting. I uh, I want to come back to OSV a little bit later and that change that's happened fairly recently from kind of the quantitative background into more venture capital. But I want to start with, I hate softball questions, but I want to start with a softball question just for listeners who aren't familiar with yourself, um, I don't want to do the tired thing of old, you know, tell us about your background. What I want to ask is, for those that do follow you on social media, there are two phrases that come up time and time again, and that is human OS and the great reshuffle. Tell mm. us about those. So human OS is a term that I stole from my friend Brian Romelli human operating system. I loved it when I first heard it because it really encapsulated this idea that, you know, we're all walking around with these quantum computers in our head and we have no operating manual. And a lot of the problems that we face as society are probably laid at the feet of the fact that, hey, there's no operating manual for human OS. And so what I try to do is come up with ideas for at least trying to figure the code out a little bit better and offer suggestions. For example, one of my more popular threads on Twitter was about the thinker and the prover, uh, basically borrowed from Dr. Orr, who uh, imagined, wouldn't it be interesting if we just separated our brain as a thinker who can think any thought it wants, right? It couldn't be like uh, Lewis Carroll. It can imagine three impossible things before breakfast. But once the thinker lands on something that resonates with it, it generally tosses it over to the prover and stops thinking about it. The prover's job is very, very simple. It just shows you everything you want to see to make that belief a reality. So it is the ultimate confirmation bias machine. And the more we understand that many of us are 80% of the time in prover mode, not thinker mode, we can see and unravel a lot of the current controversies, all of the squabbles, etc., with people basically just shouting at one another without really listening, or sometimes I say we're shouting at each other in different languages and not listening. And the the thread goes on to suggest some ways that you can reawaken the thinker and rethink ideas. Because 
One of my other observations about human OS is very few of us, and I include myself in all of this, by the way, I'm not exempt in any way. Mm -hmm. In fact, I probably (laughs) am, am more subject to some of the downsides of human OS. But one of the things that we don't understand, and it's very difficult to wrap your arms around, is many of our beliefs are assigned to us. We didn't come up with them. They were assigned to us by our parents, by our friends, by our colleagues, by our religions or our governments. And we never really take the time to really look at them and say, does this really make sense? Do I really believe this? And so human OS is just something I am endlessly fascinated with and try to always look at something through a reframe, um, which is a very powerful exercise, in my opinion. If you can reframe something, you suddenly see it as if you put better glasses on. In in terms of the Great Reshuffle, I started with that theme around 2014-15. I noticed that lots of things that used to work weren't working quite as well as they used to. And that got me into a very deep and wide rabbit hole about what's really going on when we look at the world through a sociological lens, through a political lens, through an entrepreneurial lens, et cetera, through a a technological innovation lens. And essentially what I decided was we're really going through a phase change and it is going to reshuffle lots and lots of things, both who's on top, who the elites are, what kind of ways to convince people of things work and don't work. As an example, I often tease the World Economic Forum on Twitter because to me, they're tone deaf. If you see their campaigns, you're aware of them, I'm sure, right? It's 2030 and and you are happy and you own nothing. And I think that it's a classic example of a campaign that both would have been taken seriously and might have had some impact circa 2010. But now in 2024, it literally is just providing memes for people like me to (laughs) say, yeah, don't think so. Don't, Don't think so. Now, there's a challenge there because they sometimes confuse their term, which they call the Great Reset, with my term called the Great Reshuffle. The Great Reset envisions a world, in my opinion, and of course, this is all just my opinion, and I'm often wrong, so let's get that in there. But the the Great Reset is a top-down way of looking at the world. We know what's right for you. We are smarter than you. We plan better than you. And you, you docile little sheep, will do as we say. The Great Reshuffle emerges like all complex adaptive systems. All emergence is coming from below. And when you watch these two in conflict with one another, it's quite entertaining, but also quite illuminating as well. People are waking up to the fact that many of the old models are collapsing. If you think about things like uh, publishing, filmmaking, podcasting, the power of a single publication like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times to command everyone's attention. That's all going away. And what we're seeing is what I refer to as a lengthening of the tales. Uh, The mathematician Mandelbrot, who gave us fractals and other wonderful things, has a great book called The Misbehavior of Markets. Favorite books of all time. As as it is one of mine. And it's worth it for anyone listening. If you buy it, you could buy it just for the chapter in which he dismantles efficient market theory. And he does it with evidence and empirical data, which is something I have a weakness for. Anyway, one of the one of the points of the book is we are moving into an age where we are going to be start seeing a good number of things become chaotic normal, which is a very peaky middle with very long tails. And -hmm. that's moving us out of a long period of time where everything was designed for a 
normal distribution, right? So 68% is the sweet spot. That's right in the middle. That captures 68% of the population. It's normally done for things like IQ, but you can do it for everything, for height, weight, et cetera. I'm more interested in the part where it's looking at ideas and innovation. We went from mass production, in my opinion, to we're moving into, we're still in early innings here. Or I don't know, what would it be in cricket? Would it be, what What are the first few, what do you call the first few sets in cricket? Oh, I'm, I'm not a cricket fan. I'm probably one of the rare British men that actually doesn't really understand the rules of cricket. It's oh my bit... God, I love you. I, all my British friends always tease me for like, well, you... I've heard you say, Jim, that isn't cricket. Do you know the rules? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no, well, you know, I'm I'm from my hometown is Nottingham, which has one of the most famous cricket grounds yes, in the yeah. world, Trent Bridge. And the amount of people I say, oh, I'm from Nottingham, they're like, oh, Trent Bridge. And when I say, oh, I've never been. And they look at me with a kind of disgust. <laughs> <but> you, <laughs> you cannot quantify. I love it. So I think we're in the very early innings of mass customization. You saw us developing it. I tried first to develop a mass customization tool for investing called Netfolio back in 1999, 2000. The tech wasn't quite there yet, but we beavered away and and continued to build all of our own systems so that they were very specific just for our needs. And then my son, Patrick, walked in my office and he goes, you know, we built the Death Star to kill a mouse, Dad. We should pull an AWS and make this available to all of our clients. And it was custom indexing. Patrick came up with that term, which I thought was golden. But we're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing it in book publishing. We're seeing it in music. We're seeing it in movies. You don't any longer have to have your service, your product, your entertainment devised and specifically aimed at the 68%. We now have the tools where you can have a much smaller market and still do extraordinarily well. It's why you see all Mm -hmm. of the various podcasts popping up. Everyone says, well, you know, late stage podcasting. I think they're very, very wrong. I think we're at the very beginning of a huge number of new podcasts coming online because they can be very specific to something like, I don't know, fishing and or, you know, whatever your hobby is, you're going to be able to find your audience. And because we have all of these tools coming online, like AI, like the ability to do what we're doing right now, to have a chat with somebody who's in in England and then another one who's in Connecticut and it's seamless. So if that is correct and if that thesis is correct, then you're going to see all of the older models just really literally continue to collapse. One of the things you'll see, I suspect, is what we saw when Napster came along, right? When Napster came along, the the then dominant powers reacted the way they always reacted. Sue, 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 put them out of business. We will not allow this to take place. And of course, the market wins. And we, we're at a very similar situation now. It's interesting. We were talking about Napster a couple of days ago on, on Fat Tony's, Tony's and um, we were talking about how that natural reaction is to sue. And in the noughties, you know, I, I remember being at school my friend handing me Napster on a floppy disk. I have a very, very clear memory of that. And then, so you have the suing of that and this knee-jerk reaction. And then 10 years later, once the bandwidth improved and streaming became a threat, you have the suing of videos. And the it's almost like you go through this cycle of knee-jerk reaction to sue to the, the light bulb moment of, hey, people want to pay for this. If we can make it frictionless, People won't pirate. And going back a little bit to, I asked you, you know, to talk about human OS and also the Great Reshuffle. I don't think I'd ever really thought about the connection between those two concepts until now. And when I think about what you were saying about human OS and one side of your brain being kind of the ultimate bias machine, and I think about, I think it was Karl Marx, I think it was Karl Marx that first coined the term ideology and he described it as this kind of colorless odorless gas that 
creates a prison without the need for bars. And then I think about what you were saying about the long tail and changes that are happening in the Great Reset. And I think about the polarization that traditional media is encouraging to stay relevant. And they're kind of hacking that that second half of the OS, you know, human OS system there to to kind of shout louder and louder. And, you know, in an attention economy that suddenly has an order of magnitude more competition than it did a decade ago. Traditional media has to be more polarizing. I think that's exactly what we're seeing. And, you know, it's frustrating because my opinion anyway, and like you, I'm I'm very frequently wrong, but, you know, you see these people shouting on Twitter and other forms of social media. And it's like, you guys are the same. It's like two sports fans and one's wearing a blue shirt and one's wearing a red shirt and they're shouting it to each other it's like, you know the only difference is the color of your shirt and i guarantee and you know i absolutely guarantee that the average labor or should i say the average democrat and republican to americanize this slightly the average democrat and the average republican voter have far more in common with each other than they do with the people at the top of their respective power absolutely structures. yeah i agree and the idea behind the Great Reshuffle, even you slipped and called it the Great Reset there. Uh, <laughs> oh, did I? Sorry. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I have to solve that in the post edit. <laughs> but the, the idea is, yes, you're correct about the major media. They view it as in their interests to become more polarizing, not less. We have a history example for this, though. Back during the times of the American Revolution and afterwards, each party had its own newspapers, and they shouted at each other in print uh, for quite some time trying to win the day and for the ideas that were then percolating in the United States. But now I think it's done primarily for just survival and profitable motives. Take the New York Times. So the New York Times, I still take the New York Times, even though it, I mean, honestly, I think Pravda would blush by the comparison now to the New York Times because they realized, and like, if you're looking at it as a wise investment decision, they were right. They realized that, especially when Donald Trump got elected, that seemed to break everyone's minds, not just here in the United States, but globally. Yeah. And 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 so they even have a name for it called Trump derangement syndrome. And <laughs> the idea that you could do considerably better if you picked a side and became the the Pravda, if you will, for that particular side. So that's what the Times did. Guess what happened? Their their circulation went way up. Their revenues went way up. They would hate to hear this, but I think it's true. They were saved by Donald Trump <laughs> because. Essentially, everyone if everyone was sort of feeling unmoored, and they were searching for their tribe. And so the, the loudest signal was like a schnelling point, and that's where they all gravitated toward. Now, on the other side of the aisle, there was always Fox News. There was always that type of thing. So it's not just on one side. It's both sides. Yeah. And I think that I'm always amused. I stopped watching television news 12 years ago because I was seeing it just devolving into almost poison for the mind. And people would say, and I would tell them, oh, it's just like a cloud lifts. If just read your news. You don't have to have the propagandists shouting at you 24-7. And the replies were almost always the same from very bright people, I might add. They would say, yes, if it was a more liberal friend of mine, they would say, yes, you are exactly right. Fox News is pure propaganda, but PBS is really, really good. <laughs> and, and then the conservatives would say, yes, you are exactly right, but it's the Wall Street Journal that hasn't gone insane. And my God, look at the New York Times and the Guardian and all of these particular publications. So it's it's like a blindness to because of the prover saying all you're seeing all you're seeing is one point of view you're putting yourself in a bubble and you're self-selecting into that bubble and when all you hear is the same opinion played back to you time and time again 
Well, welcome to the soul of propaganda, right? This is Edward Bernays, who was not a good guy, if you want to look into his history, but he was quite clever. And he was the guy who changed the name of propaganda to public relations. No, 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 no. Let's rebrand this. It's not propaganda. We're relating with the public. And if you look at his history, I mean... Again, if you're a Machiavellian who uh, likes kind of evil uh, things foot, this guy was hired by the United Fruit Company to reverse a democratic election in Guatemala because they didn't like the new government. Yeah, He didn't fire a single shot. He did it all through propaganda. And the power of propaganda is quite evident in everything you see, read, or hear. I often say, like, one of the things I've internalized is whenever I'm reading anything, I always ask myself, even if I agree with, I say to myself, why am I reading this now? Who benefits if I believe this? Who suffers if I believe this, etc.? By taking your, by playing with that human OS aspect and trying to continually take your, your mind through, wait a minute, why am I reading this now? Who yeah. benefits? Who benefits, etc. You see this, and it's it's almost like putting on a new pair of spectacles and saying, "Oh my God, this is so obvious." And I think it was Lord uh, Whitehead who said, "All great periods are also chaotic periods," and I think that we're kind of right now in the middle of one of those. It's like that uh, the ancient Chinese curse: "May you live in interesting times." Exactly, which I think is actually an urban myth. I, I do too. Yeah. As it, as it turns out, I think, Sebastian, I think most of our favorite examples are in fact myths or apocryphal stories. It's like the frog, right? The boiling the frog. That isn't what happens. When you turn the, when you turn the heat up, the frog jumps out of the thing because he feels the heat. <laughs> Never let the truth get in the way of a good story is a motto I've heard time and again. Exactly. <laughs> It's interesting what you're saying, though. You know, is this a downside to, you know, the long tail that's emerging with a great reshuffle? You're talking about revolutionary times where you had different papers that would shout at each other. But back then, you would still be confronted with a more balanced reality in your day to day life. Now, yes, if I am fascinated by restoring 1950s toy die cast metal cars i can create a business or find a community but also i can totally isolate myself in a belief bubble absolutely correct and that is in fact what we are seeing more and more of um and one of the things that i think will happen is and and this just might be incredibly wishful thinking because at our core genetically evolutionarily speaking we are tribal creatures. There's a there's a great quote, um, and there's a lot of benefits to being a tribal creature, right? So there's a great quote. I can't remember who, who the author was, but it was along the lines of, drop a single naked human being into a forest that is ripe with anim- predator animals, and you've just given them a lovely meal. Drop 100 humans naked in that forest, and you've introduced the new apex predator. And the idea that our ability to coordinate and plan and work together is why we are the apex predator on this planet today. And so tribalism does, in fact, serve a very useful purpose. But now we're seeing many more of the downsides of it because we do live in these in these echo chambers. And and what's funny is we do it voluntarily because a lot of people, this sounds very caustic and I don't mean it to be caustic, but a lot of people just don't want to think. They they would just rather, you know, go through their day, try to minimize any kind of discomfort or whatnot. I mean, again, don't look at what people say, look at what they do, right? And and so what they do is they always are trying to minimize discomfort, minimize controversy for the most part, unless they're a different personality type. And and so you can get lost in these in these echo chambers. Now, there are some ideas that I have about ways of getting out of them. 
Um, I myself, for example, regularly read things that I know I'm going to disagree with. Uh, GPT, chat GPT is really good at writing steel man arguments. So what I do is I find a piece that might be written by somebody who I uh, vehemently di- disagree with. So for example, Yudowski, who wants to launch missile strikes on GPU plants, and to me is a comic, uh, kind of like a cartoon character. But I'm like, well, let's see what he's got. So I would take a piece from him and others, by the way, I don't want to just pick on him. Uh, and I would put it into chat GPT, and then ask questions and then, and then say, please steal man this are his argument. And I'll tell you, I led, it led to a lot of things that I hadn't really considered. So great food for thought made me think, okay, maybe I, he's less of a cartoon character than I think. I still disagree with him, but at least looking at the strongest version of his argument. And then, of course, I will do it on the EAC side of things. You know, that's the effective acceleration movement. and. Uh, you you steel man them, and you look at you compare the steel mans. Then you also do a devil's advocate for each, um, and it's just a great way to try to see. Well, you know what? They actually have a point here that it wouldn't be bad for us to introduce over here because we're going to probably have to deal with it at some point anyway. So definitely think that there will come online come into creation, a series of almost training apps for people who are interested. Uh, Tim Urban wrote a pretty good book released last year. I've had him on the podcast a couple of times. He's super smart in the way he thinks about it. Mm -hmm. And he's got kind of the the thinking tree and he's very funny, right? And so at at the bottom of the tree is a monkey and that's like all of us. (laughs) 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 And he's he's trying to get us up the thought tree where we can actually disagree with people without venom and without rancor. Um, so, so I definitely think that things will emerge. The Overton window is shifting rapidly. I'm sure you're aware of that as we look at what's being discussed now versus even six months ago. Uh, and, and so yeah. I tend to look at all of our systems as complex adaptive systems and as you know, complex adaptive system has emergence from below, not from above. I think it's one of the reasons why, you know, top-down planned economies always fail is because, no, actually, your committee isn't the greatest minds in the world. The greatest minds in the world are the human colossus made up of all types of cognitive styles. And that's why I'm so in favor, for example, of open source on in AI as opposed to closed source. But yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fascinating and probably bumpy five to ten next years. But but I like what comes out on the other side of it. Absolutely, and you're you're definitely preaching to the converted with me in terms of bottom up versus top down. But you mentioned open source; it's fascinating. If you look at sociologically what happened in the early noughties, I'm a software developer by trade, so I look through the world in that lens and. When you look at what happened in the early noughties, when you saw this open source movement happening and suddenly versus the 1990s, where it will cost, even if you just wanted to buy a code compiler, you might be looking at several hundred dollars, right? And suddenly what you saw in the early noughties was this open source movement where you could build a web facing complicated tech stack for free. And what you saw come out of that was essentially web 2.0. You saw a bunch of college kids and teenagers tinkering with this technology and creating, you know, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want to change tack slightly here and start talking about OSV and AI a little bit. But jumping the gun, do you see AI for the generation below us having a similar effect? Open source AI, should I say, with stability AI having a similar effect? I think so. I think that there's a reason why Linux runs the web. Again, we had mostly Balmer at Microsoft calling it a cancer and communism and all these things. And again, another neat thing to do is follow the money. And when you follow the money, you see why exactly he was making those statements. If I was in his position and of that disposition of mind, I might too. But the superiority comes, in my opinion, 
from cognitive diversity. It, there's another great quote, which is, no matter how brilliant a person, no matter how switched on, no matter how intelligent, you cannot ask them to create a list of things that would never occur to them. Mm. And Kind of the unknown unknowns. Yeah, but guess what? If we're building the human colossus well, and I think we are now, there are going to be drawn to that project's people with a very different frame of reference on all of the problems or opportunities present in that particular enterprise. And that's how, I mean, Adam Smith, the invisible hand, right? There is a reason why markets are work so well, and it is because the the wisdom of crowds in the correct way, right? People will always they say, well, wait a minute, wasn't the great book The Madness of Crowds? And yeah, but for the wisdom of crowds to be beneficial, you have to have heterogeneous opinions, not homogeneity. You have to have variety of uh, prizes, if you will, available to all the members of the crowd making their guesses. And you have to have cognitive diversity. There's a good book by James Surowiecki, which is a bit dated now, but I think the premise is still there. Mm. And, you know, it's really, really quite fascinating when you have a heterogeneous group of people making predictions on something. The average of that group, if it's if N is large enough, the average of that group is almost always closest to the true value, even higher, even closer than the best guess that won the prize. Yes, right. This is the the weight of the cow at the country fair kind of guessing. Exactly, exactly. So I think that that's we're seeing at work in open source. We have so many different points of view being expressed, so many different types of unique ways of looking at solving a problem. And specifically, neuroatypicals tend to be much better at this than neurotypicals, right? I used to joke that uh, the reason that we have the problems that we have with social media is because all of our social media sites were designed and shipped by neuroatypicals, and then they were used by neurotypicals who didn't quite understand. <laughs> Wait a minute. This person says something I disagree with. I'm going to shout at them. <laughs> I think there's a, a famous webcomic, and it's just two two panes, and the wife is like, honey, it's late, come to bed. And he's sat at his desk, and he's like, I can't. It's like, why? It's like, there's someone on the internet that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know that panel well. And and it's and it's so funny because it's so true. I think that ultimately our conceit that we are rational beings is a I bury I didn't bury the lead. It's a conceit. I think that human OS is driven mostly by emotions. And I think that the emotion that is the king of all the other emotions is fear, specifically fear of the unknown. And we see this throughout history. There's a great website called pessimism.org. Um, and what they do is they collect all of the headlines from whenever a major innovation happened. And sure enough, whenever there was a major innovation, you saw how it was going to destroy civilization. It was going to ruin, bring Armageddon sooner. And, you know, it goes all the way back to Socrates deciding that writing wasn't a good idea. <laughs> and you, you see it in the media of the time. It fascinates me. For example, you know, you see Mary Shelley's Frankenstein come out around the time that electricity starts becoming, and it's like, oh, this electricity can create an inhuman, soulless monster. And it seems laughable now. You know, you see the modern equivalent of it, of it now, and you do. And, you know, it's a very human thing, but maybe it's an evolutionary defense mechanism. You know, there's always this gradient curve of progress that a societal level keeps us from extinction and i think there's people pulling in one direction which want progress but progress too fast can cause cataclysmic mistakes and then there's the traditional people who pull against it and i like to think of it like a soap bubble you know how they say a soap bubble is held together by surface tension that's how I see society. It's held together by the surface tension of all these disparaging views. And despite all the craziness, it forms, you know, a coherent 
beautiful structure. Yeah, that's an interesting analogy. Um, and and I think that by and large, it's correct. Um, I think that happens sometimes, though. I'm a huge fan of uh, Professor Deutsch, who's at Oxford or Cambridge. He's at Oxbridge. And he wrote the wonderful book, The Beginning of Infinity. And, and he talks about the idea, his Again, for your listeners, if you haven't read it, I urge you to read it. Again, it's a brilliant book. Yeah, and he provides the scaffolding for considering these ideas. He has a point of view, obviously, but he builds from the foundation level up, which I love. And and one of the things that he points out is that the precautionary principle rules often societies where the end result ends up as stasis and death and and that one needs to always be searching for better explanations but to be mindful that we're going to get a lot wrong it's got you know fabulism is essentially the theory that yeah we're going to innovate but a lot of the things that we do are going to be wrong and we're going to have to fix them but sort of back to fear and and back to the reluctance of of uh, big parts of society to embrace change or innovation is the idea that we're all the descendants of the cowards that ran away. So if we were like on the savanna in Africa and there was a bush rustling, we're the descendants of the folks who booked it in the other direction, <laughs> not the not the curious, inquisitive one who goes, oh, "I wonder what that is." Then they get by the lion. So do have, I think, genetically a predisposition to being more cautious than we might otherwise be. Now, obviously, you can't optimize for level of caution. At least I haven't been able to figure that out. But the idea that this is the immediate base reaction makes a lot of sense, right? Like we we fear the novel. That's why you kind of saw the ability during the pandemic. like In normal circumstances in free countries like the UK, like America, et cetera, telling people that they couldn't leave their homes would generally lead to you know, open rebellion. Uh, but there was a novel fear out there, the COVID virus. And you saw compliance of even libertarian-style societies go way, way up. I think that that was the result, essentially, of our predisposition to really fearing novel threats. If, if, I, if I may do a shameless plug here, the, the previous episode of this, we talked at length about the precautionary principle with a nurse who's based in New York during COVID, the lessons learned from that, and the publication of Nassim's precautionary principle paper. And you're right, you're absolutely right. In novel circumstances, the goalposts shift. And what's the counter argument to that, I suppose, is we're talking about the savannah and running away from the tiger. I think we see that in a slightly more meta way these days in conspiracy theories, where yes, maybe ninety nine percent of them are ninety nine point nine percent of them are, you know, crackpots, but societal level there's a protective mechanism there evolution for, for, for the one in a thousand that are correct. So my take on that, I think you're absolutely right about the abundance of conspiracy theories. But my view is more along the lines of during chaotic periods, people want things to make sense. And on the face of it, a lot of things that are happening to just a casual observer don't make sense. And so Coherence is very important to remaining sane as a human. If if you run into somebody who is decohering, that's not a pretty sight. And so when people see all of these things happening, they they absolutely fall into the it must be some grand conspiracy driven from up here. And you know, conspiracies have a long and storied history. And if you look at some of the big ones like the Illuminati, uh, et cetera, you'll find that they coincide, generally speaking, with periods of great change in society. Now, the changes were different, right? The movement from the Sun King anointed by God to elected officials, that was a big move. People 
fail to consider just how much of a shift in the worldview that caused. And so that gave birth to tons and tons of conspiracy theories. And so I think that it didn't surprise me at all that we would see all of the various conspiracy theories that we're seeing primarily. And by the way, this is apolitical from my view. There are conspiracy theories on the left. There are conspiracy theories on the right. Mm-hmm. And I think it is in a, it is the lowest form, in my opinion, of sense making. People are trying to make sense of things that on the face of them don't really make sense, right? Crack crack the handle to process of the information that they're being deluge deluge with and form a coherent narrative. Exactly. And and then the challenge with that is now we're back to the thinker prover. People's provers work over time when they are in one of these conspiracy bubbles. And and it's a form of a mental prison, in my opinion. And, you know, it's pretty hard to come up with an escape plan if you don't know you're in prison. And and so the challenge there is like, have you read Eric Hoffer's True Believer? No, I haven't. Oh, I highly suggest it. You might like it. He wrote it, I think, in the 1950s. Interesting man, longshoreman who turned into this profound philosopher and, and wrote lots and lots of really great books, The True Believer being one of his better ones. But it's this idea that when things are very unsettled, peop- and now this is back to our people seeking to co- cohere, they also seek out like-minded people. And as they do that, they create that bubble. Sometimes it's a conspiracy, sometimes it's something innocent, like your your train set model example from earlier. But but they definitely feel greatly much more comfortable in that environment because there is no dissonance, right? Everyone is, you're right, Jim, you're right, Jim, you're right, Jim. And that is not a helpful thing if you want to actually see where things might be going. And so definitely think that it's part and parcel to the way we're programmed. And from from my way of looking at it, this too shall pass, right? One thing to understand is that probably not going to change a true believer's beliefs with facts. The, The only way you can do it is some interesting demonstration, usually through a story or through a different frame of reference. Uh, to get them to reconsider what they're doing. Personally, I don't believe I can change anyone's mind. I believe that I can be a resource. I can be useful. uh, I can be helpful. But I think ultimately, everyone has to come to the changes of thought on their own. uh, Because, you know, a a man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. Um, And there's a good book, that I give out, it's called Power vs. Force. And essentially, the author is a medical doctor. And he makes the point that for most of human history, what's been used is force. No, you will believe this, you will uh, serve this leader. Oh, and if you don't, we'll kill you. And that's a powerful inducement to say, okay, count me in. Uh, He uses the term power, I would have picked a different word, but semantics aside, to mean allowing a space for people to see all of the various ideas and influencing them rather than forcing them. And I, I subscribe very much to that view. It's interesting. It goes back to when you talk about human OS and you know thoughts and decisions being emotional-based rather than fact-based. Jim, I want to change tack a little bit now and talk about OSV. O'Shaughnessy Ventures, which is something you set up fairly recently. I heard it described as kind of the third chapter or the third act of your career. Now, what I wanted to ask is, uh, you know, you come from a quantitative background. And from what I can see, a lot of what happens at OSV is related to film and media. How drove that shift and how easy did you find that change? So I've always kind of been both. I've always loved ideas, books, writing. I'm a mm-hmm. huge reader of fiction, nonfiction. Um, and 
the the disconnect for a lot of people who don't know me is like for the first part of my 20s, all I did was write up novel ideas and screen treatments. It was something I was just loved to do. But I was also absolutely enamored of trying to figure out the Olympics of business, Wall Street, or the city for folks who are in the UK. And uh, the, the, the path that I took led me to the quantitative approach, primarily because I learned early on that this fits kind of beautifully with what we were talking about. People who make decisions usually make them emotionally, and that in public markets, that was a really bad way to make decisions. And I had an experience going into the crash of 1987 that was what finally flipped me to being an entire quant. Um, and, and that was I was using a quantitative system uh, that looked at valuations in the marketplace. It was it's comically naive by today's standards, but it worked pretty well, actually. And would simply, it didn't say, you know, a crash is going to happen on this day or markets are going to soar and tell. It just said, which directionally, which way does the market seem to be moving? Is it moving upwards, sideways, or down? Um, and when it was, the system said upwards, I would go long calls, which are options to buy the market at a predetermined price that you do very well if it gets well above that predetermined price. And when it was pointing downwards, I would go long puts, which means that you get to sell securities at previous prices after they've collapsed. So I was going into the 1987 crash, which is the largest crash in a single day in the United States, uh, surpassing even the 1929 crash. Uh, with the largest put position I had ever held. And I was an emotional wreck. And I had brokers calling me saying, are you still sitting on these things are going to expire? Bah, 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 bah. And, and, and then I had a friend who I really admired his way of looking at the world, called me and he's like, Jim, you got to get out of these puts. Today's low. A lot of people don't know. The day before Black Monday was a horrible day in the market, uh, just not nearly as horrible as what happened on Monday. But he called me about a half an hour before close, and he goes, this is it. It's washed out. You know, I'd bet my bottom dollar on it. You know, all the, it's my conviction. I got a feeling, all of these things. And I sold them all the day before the biggest crash in the United States history in which I would have made a fortune on those out those puts that I sold. And so I kind of had I review everything I do by writing it out and saying, here's where I went right, here's where I went wrong. And then I still have the notebook around here somewhere, but it was like, I think one of the best ways that I can do well in public markets is to arbitrage human nature. And, you know, Quant, some, back then, like no one really knew what quant was. And in fact, most of the research that I did for my first book didn't best like the best. I had to turn to psychological research. There was no financial behavioral research available at the time. And there were academic papers, of course, the most famous from French and Fama, uh, but they were testing like just price to book value. And and I became fascinated by the idea that people often get things right, but then their emotions get in the way and and for a variety of reasons derail them. Mm. And so I thought, well, I think that this idea that if I'm directionally right um the majority of the time. And if I can withstand the times I'm wrong, and those are the times that try men souls, uh, you know, your wonderful bard, Mr. Shakespeare, wrote a couplet, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. That's kind of what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so that's the hard part, right? Sticking with it when everyone's calling you an idiot, a fool, and a moron. Um, and it's it's very sinusoidal, right? 
So you go from hero and genius to goat fool. Mm. Hero genius, goat fool. But in aggregate, it seemed like a very sensible way to drive an empirically driven approach to kind of counter our human emotional side. It didn't mean I didn't have one. I did. And in fact, my, I might have had more of one, and that's what became a blunt. I wrote a piece saying that, you know, without these guide rules, I probably would have been the worst offender of all of these particular things. And so the switchover is uh, perhaps more nuanced. I'm doing things now that I've always loved, but didn't have the ability or bandwidth to focus on when I was running a asset management firm. We still take quantitative views of things, but we marry them with qualitative mm. views in a variety of things in all of our verticals. So the verticals are essentially things that I've always been interested in. Uh, early stage investing, we started doing that in 06. Films, I've been a film and movie buff since I was a teenager, and we now have the tools to be able to make them at vastly reduced costs. And by the way, back to the great reshovel, a different business model. Yeah. Same books. I love books and I've published four. And I would talk to more and more authors, uh, both fiction and nonfiction, and they all had exactly the same read as mine. Traditional publishers are horrible. They're horrible. And we, we've allowed this, this disequilibrium in economics to persist, even though it has no need to. So, for example, Infinite Books will be giving 70% of the revenue to the author. 30% will stay with us after we recapture costs. But we'll be doing a lot of things that were pain points for authors. And were easily collect correctable even 10 years ago. Now, my goodness, the tools available are extraordinary. We'll be able to publish books on demand in every language because the AI can translate it into that particular language. And not just uh, not just books. I think I saw, you know, you've got live translation of videos into different languages now. Yes, we do. Which is incredible. And not just like, you know, these 1970s Kung Fu movies where it was really <laughs> bad lip sync, like, you know, actual lip sync, correct live translation. And it was interesting what you were saying about the the physiology and psychological makeup of trading. You've given some great book recommendations so far. I'd like to give one of my own, which is, I'm probably going to mess this up, the title, The Hour Between the Dog and the Wolf. Oh, that's a great book. Yeah. Which talks about the philology of trading. Fantastic book. So so you, would you say there's a difference in skill set between looking for opportunities in the market as a trader or an asset manager between looking for opportunities in venture capital? Or is it the same game? It is a very different game from my perspective. A, a, a more fundamentally oriented investor in public markets probably wouldn't agree with that statement. Uh, from the point of view of a quant, they're very, very different. In early stage investing, it's basically all about people, literally all about people. And was wrong. I thought it was going to be all about the idea or all about the market that was not being addressed, et cetera, et cetera. You've preempted one of my questions I was going to ask you. Was it people versus uh, idea? But that's really good to know. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not enough to have a great idea. You have to have the team executing against that idea work. Uh, because if it doesn't, it doesn't matter how great the idea is. That particular early stage company will probably fail. And, and so that was a big learning for me. One thing that we are doing at OSB on our adventure side, and by the way, we call it Adventures Not Ventures because that was one of the original names for venture capital. Adventure capital. Oh yeah, like the the old people in the Jamaica coffee house in London, kind of adventure capital back in the day. Yeah. Exactly. And there's another one that I love even more. Um, and it's called liberation capital uh, because when it really got it started, like people, there weren't entrepreneurs in the sense that we have them today. People went to work for big companies, and mm. you know they wanted that secure salary and all of that entails. And 
So the the traitorous eight who left to form what ultimately became Intel, yeah, the the fellow who financed them said, no, 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 no. This is your liberation capital, which I love, um, and. And so we do use quantitative screens on the idea side um, and less so on the people side. Uh, There we're relying more. I definitely believe that there is such a thing as saturated or imbued intuition. And by that, I mean, if you encounter the same pattern time and time and time again, you begin to sort of notice it much more quickly as it builds over time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm fascinated by combining these two. I think that a holistic approach, which draws both on empirical and non-empirical inputs, ultimately offers the, the best chance at doing well with an investment. Now, you also have to be quite content with the idea that this is a power law game and yeah. you know you're you're going to you're going to invest in 20 companies and 17 of them are going to do nothing or go bankrupt and 3 of them are going to make up for all of your winnings uh in the portfolio definitely think that people like me are beneficiaries again of if if risk seeking behavior i.e going long volatility. If that were normally distributed, there would be no Elon Musk, there would be no Bezos, there would be none of these uh, founders who've done so very, very well. It isn't normally distributed. I think that maybe 90% of the population wants to be short vol. They want, they'll sell vol. And the key here is they're selling it way too cheaply. And so you get guys like me who love vol. We get we get a bargain basement price on this. Again, going back to human OS, because your average person hates volatility. They love certainty. They love uh, insurance. Well, the way I look at the world, I can be certain about one thing, and even that one, I'm not so certain about anymore. And that's debt, right? I, I, I everything else is a probability to me. And and I think that this this desire for the illusion of certainty is what drives that uh, willingness to sell vol for way below what they should be selling it for. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a classic example of human OS observation. Oh, okay, I see why I get to get all of these deals at prices that I think are reasonable. It's because I have a super high tolerance for variability. It's, uh, you know, and there's that evolutionary aspect, again, going back to running away from the bush, uh, from from the shadow versus the tiger. And the soap bubble analogy, we need both types of people, I think, to maintain that gradient of growth. So, Jim, we're coming up, I know, for about 15 more minutes. And I like to do is hand over to the Fat Tony's community now and people who have submitted questions for you, knowing this interview is coming up. And these are always a little bit chaotic, but we've got a few that have been voted on here. And I want to use this time just to ask you the top two. So um, this is the first one is highly linked into what we've just been talked about. And he said, Fat Tony in Nassim Taleb's books famously said the best trades come to you. Have you found this is true in your venture capital arm? Or or indeed your your previous world of investment management? So I think I'm going to answer yes to both parts of that. Um, the the essence of quantitative investment in public markets is you let the names come to you. You have no opinion. Uh, I used to joke with my friend Cliff Asnes that it would be far better for us quants to just have numbers, not even tickers, uh, and let the trade come to us. That's exactly almost the definition of what we're doing. We're looking for these characteristics. We don't care what sector it's in. We don't care who the CEO is. We don't care what people's opinions are. It, in fact, does come to us. Um, On the venture side, I'm I'm seeing my sample size is probably not big enough to make a a coherent and definitive statement. But yeah, 
the some of the best results that we're seeing short term, um, and obviously they could go awry. So let's add that caveat and footnote there. Um, but our situations where the founders literally sought us out, sort of like you are the person that we think really understands what we're trying to achieve here, and we would love if you would be invested with us. That that's happened more than than chance would indicate, and with the results of the companies that did so being in much better positions, at least at this time and what we're talking, to to go on to, to do quite well. So yeah, I guess I guess Fat Tony got that one right. <laughs> Great. Well, moving on, and I think this will be our, our last question. And again, it's from the community. If you were somehow forbidden from pursuing wealth, security, or freedom, how specifically would you spend your wealth and time? And there's a caveat here that he's added. With family and with people I love are cop-out answers. I'd like to know Jim's opinion on the best possible end use of wealth and time. Well, they are specifically precluding the best uses of wealth and time. Um, So I suspect that I would spend all of my time and money trying to understand things better by reading, by writing, by watching. Um, And then I would, in a perfect world, uh, make all of that available to everyone um, on a website or some other form where everyone could have access to it. And they could pick it apart. They could say, yeah, he's totally wrong about this, or I hadn't thought about that aspect of it. Um, so yeah, if uh, if I was precluded from all of the above, and I was not <laughs> given the easy out of hanging out with my family, which I love to do, uh, yeah, I think that's the I think that's what I would use it for. What, what's wonderful about that answer is I'm, I'm an optimist at heart, and I genuinely believe things on the whole tend to get better over time. And that does seem to be the way society is heading. Even, you know, I grew up in the 90s. And if you look at the availability to resource education, you know, I was I was a young geek programming, you know, from a young age. But even then, the resources were limited. And when I look at what's available now, it is mind blowing to me. And I maybe I'm in denial, but even I don't because you know, I don't consider myself that old. But even compared to my childhood, it's absolutely astronomical, the information that's available. And I I love that. Well, unfortunately, wish i could talk to you for hours you're such an amazing erudite guest you're a phenomenal conversationalist but you know before we finish up jim you know every book we've referenced obviously links to osv and various websites will be will be placed where we distribute this but is there anything else you wanted to give a shout out to or mention or something that you were you were dying to talk about that we haven't had chance to yet i guess i'll give a shout out to everyone listening uh, something very simple, but it really can change and reframe your perspective. And that is, don't look for things to root against. Look for things to root for. There's so much that's happening in the world right now that I think is for the better. And our uh, back to evolution, our natural predilections give us a tinge of pessimism. And so, it's, it is not heavy lifting, lifting to look for things to root against, but be on the side of people rooting for things, because I think that both changes your perspective and really uh, lets you put better things out into the world. What a fantastic way to end. Jim O'Shaughnessy, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure as well. Thanks so much. Thank you.